Solar Man. We are into the second of a six part series on six questions innovative thinkers ask. Last time we talked about where, uh, spatial thinking. This time we're going to talk about when, temporal thinking. Whilst in middle school, I wrote a paper on imaginary number. I gave the paper to my teacher. My argument was that imaginary number is associated with time. And he looked at the paper and said that uh, mathematician had understood very well the notion of imaginary numbers. So he gave the paper back to me. Years later, my teacher apologized to me. So what are imaginary numbers? What you have is, if you think about a triangle, where one side is of length one, and the other side is of a length i, imaginary number which is equal to square root minus one, then you add up one square plus i square, and that adds up to a length of zero. So the solution to this equation will be i square equal to minus one, and therefore i is a square of minus one. Last time we talked about seeing space as we observe the universe through a telescope. Uh, space is where light can travel through. Uh, and space can be measured in terms of distance given by how much light has traveled over a particular period of time. We can likewise measure time by means of the time it takes for light to travel a particular distance. That the time interval will be given by the distance divided by the speed of light. We know that the speed of light is a constant no matter what reference frame you're in. We can represent four-dimensional space-time in four coordinates, the x, y, and c coordinate, as well as the time coordinate t. Now, we represent this by having x1, y1, c1, and instead of the real time, we talk about i, which is the imaginary number, times the speed of light, i, c, t1. Now, you can think about light coming out from this source of disturbance. For example, if this is a supernova, uh, it is expanding, the light uh, come out as an expanding light sphere. Now, the position on this expanding light sphere is given by x squared plus y squared plus c squared equal to ct squared. All right? So, you have a formula which is de describing the frontier of the light sphere in terms of x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals ct squared. Now, if you take this ct squared on this side, so you have minus ct squared instead, you will find that actually you can associate the imaginary number i uh, ct and then you have plus i ct squared because the square of i is minus 1, therefore you will have x squared plus y squared plus c squared is e minus c t c square t square is equal to zero. Okay. Now you can see the expanding sphere. For example, this is a supernova, and then the light will be coming out like this. So literally, this is a description of the surface of the light sphere x square plus y square plus c square equal to c square t square. Now suppose you have two events x one y one c one and i c t one, and then another point p two. We can calculate the distance between these two points by subtracting off each of the component and squaring that difference, and that will be the Euclidean distance between the, the two points. So what you have here is that I actually has a negative distance, as mentioned earlier in Pythagoras' theorem, uh, I squared plus 1 equal to 0. So this described distance measure for which the time component has an imaginary name for which the Euclidean distance when adding the time component actually subtract off from the Euclidean distance component. According to Einstein, he said that the law of physics, including the speed of light, is the same no matter what inertial reference frame that you are in. Now, suppose we have two inertial reference frames. One is described by x, y, and z, as well as t and the other one being described by x prime, y prime, c prime, and t prime. Okay, now suppose initially the two sphere are the same sphere, so, but on the other hand, the center of the second sphere moves out at a velocity of u, uh, so at the time t, it would have moved a distance of ut. Now the question is, if you see the two sphere uh, of light, 
This is seen by the moving object. It will see that basically it's expanding uh, as a sphere at a velocity, and also moving out at a velocity of u. Whereas the first person will see that as this particular sphere here. Now, they are the same light. So from a stationary point of view, uh, what this sphere is, is actually the same as this sphere, okay? But if you're moving, then you only see this sphere, which is moving out to uh, 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 at the same velocity as, as it moves. Now, if you want to say that actually from a ground point of view, the coordinate system according to the second person moving out at a velocity of u is uh, x prime, y prime, c prime, and t prime, and as well as t prime, then you can make a transformation and for which you have x prime is equal to a factor gamma x minus ut, and y prime, because it's not moving in this direction, is equal to y, c prime is equal to c, and t prime also is multiplied by a factor gamma of t minus ux squared divided by c squared, uh, and gamma is the so-called Lorentz contraction. It is smaller than one. So what you have is that not only you have a uh, contraction of uh, the x-axis measure as seen by uh, the stationary person on the length measure of the second person moving out at a, distance, uh, at a velocity of u, you also have a time dilation. Time, the clock moves slower by a factor of gamma also. Now, how do we know that this transformation will give back the same sphere as this sphere? Well, you make the substitution of x prime, y prime, c prime, and t prime according to this formula. You plug this into this equation, you will get back this equation, the original equation that described the uh, sphere, uh, the original sphere. So this actually proved that this Lorentz transformation is the correct transformation whereby you, according to the person seen uh, not moving, he looked at the system of coordinates of uh, the moving person, he would experience a contraction in the length as well as a dilation, or basically the clock moves slower uh, by the same factor of gamma, which depends on the speed this person is moving relative to the other person. So that proves uh, this contraction is correct. Uh, according to Einstein's notion that the speed of light is constant, all right? Now, let me just warn you. A lot of people think that when you, uh, you're moving, your length contract or your uh, time slow down. That's not true. You don't experience, uh, you know, you become thinner or that the clock is moving slow. It's only perceived by the other person who is uh, for which you, are, you have a relative velocity, okay? So, length doesn't contract. Anybody in their own system will observe things as if they are moving or not moving relative to the other person. Uh, likewise, we'll talk about that mass. Actually, you, you don't become heavier if you're moving at a, at a speed that is closer to the velocity of light. This we'll talk about next time we talk about energy. So let me just repeat what we see is that one system doesn't move and the other system moves at the velocity of uh, the second uh, uh, velocity of u. So what happens is that you will see basically along the x-axis the width contract that as seen by this person, the width of this person contract in the x-axis and his clock slow down also. So what happened is that when we make the statement that the second person also see light moving at the same uh, speed of light as the first one, whereas the first system will see basically uh, the reason why the second person see light as a constant state is because first his length contract and second his time slow down and therefore they are, when you talk about a velocity c uh, or any velocity for that matter, is not changed from the measurement of the second person because uh, while he's moving, the third person seen uh, him, uh, saw him as if uh, his lane contract and the time slowed down, therefore the velocity of light remains the same because they cancel out the fact of gamma. Many of you were told that we can't travel at a speed faster than light speed. The reason for that is that if you do that, you can travel back to the past 
and you can cause a lot of trouble. For example, you can go back to the past to kill your grandfather, and therefore you won't be here to send the message. Now, the explanation is given by the train example of Einstein. For example, you have Alice and Barbie seated on a train that is moving at the velocity of u in this direction. And then on the ground is Andy and Bob. And Andy and Bob would like to send the information at a time when this horse won the race. So right then, he would send the message to Alice, and Alice having an instantaneous transmitter, meaning that it, can, it takes no time to travel the Barbie, would send the information over the Barbie uh, that uh, this horse called uh, Charlie has won the race. Now, if Barbie sent the information to Bob instantaneously, and Bob sent the information back to Andy instantaneously, what would happen? Now, even though Alice and Barbie are raising their hand in a synchronous way, uh, the ground doesn't see the raising of hand as being simultaneous, largely because Barbie is moving in this direction, so it takes less time for Barbie to receive the signal from the light in the middle of the train than Alice on the other side. So in essence, what both Bob and Andy will see Barbie raising the hand at an earlier time, all right, because of that different notion of simultaneous raising of hand. Now, what happened is, if Andy sent a message at Charlie, he has won the race, and then Alice sent a message instantaneous to Barbie, which according to Bob, he would imagine that actually Barbie uh, was receiving this message earlier than when Andy sent the message. So when Bob sent a message back to Andy, the message that Charlie has won the race arrived before Andy sent out the message that Charlie has run. And therefore, Andy could take that message uh, that comes from the future at a time that's earlier than Charlie has won the race. And he put the bet on Charlie and therefore won, uh, won uh, a lot of money. That's a logical contradiction and therefore traveling faster than the speed of light as dictated by the instantaneous transmitter that all these persons has is a logical fallacy. Now, I haven't explained that time is associated with the imaginary dimension uh, following the same uh, Euclidean uh, theory about distances in the four-dimensional space-time. We would like to look at another aspect of time, which is a, can we exponentiate complex numbers, right? So we can calculate distance according to the Euclidean formula. Now we're going to do exponentiation. Now, if you look at exponentiation, say c is equal to e raised to the power of a plus bi, the square root of minus one, and you can factor the two, e to the a times e to the bi, and according to Euler, e to the bi is cosine b plus i, the imaginary number times sine b. So this formula, if you apply b as i omega, uh, as uh, omega t, meaning that this is the space dimension and this is the time dimension associated with it, then what you have is that you can think about this as being e to the a, which is an exponentiation of a real number. It could be growing exponentially. And then you can have cosine omega t, and plus i sine omega t. So you map this exponentiation in complex plane. If a is positive, it's increasing exponentially. And the cosine omega is the real component, and the sine omega t is the imaginary component. So these two would be kind of like, uh, circling out, and that's the complex ex uh, exponential function map in the complex plane correspond to the Bernoulli spiral that we talked about last time. Now, if you take complex exponential e to the a plus bi, if a is equal to 1, then what you see is that this, this is a constant uh, radius, and the cosine corresponds to this movement here, and the real component trace out over time, uh, this is time axis, a uh, cosine function. Uh, the imaginary component will map out a sine function. Now, we electrical engineers know a lot about uh, 
uh, sinusoid because we talk about alternating current a lot. So we understood that. So what you have is exponentiation in uh, the complex plane give you sine and cosine function, whereas the real component of that correspond to either decaying away of the, of the amplitude or an exponentially growing amplitude. So I hope you understand two aspects. First, that time corresponds to in the imaginary component of the four-dimensional space time. And second, that uh, exponentiation in time uh, is a sinusoidal function. So a lot of our physical phenomena, such as the propagation of electromagnetic wave, or in quantum mechanics, the probability wave of a particle uh, have a, a sinusoidal form, and that has to do with the imaginary component of the time axis. So time is really different from space because you can you can only move to the future and not back to the past. Otherwise, you would violate cause and effect because cause always precedes in time uh, the effect. So causal thinking is logical thinking because we can say if x earlier occurring in time is a cause of y, we say if x then y. So in English, very often we have a subject, a verb, and an object. The subject is the cause by means of the action, the verb, and then the effect would be on the object itself. So it's a cause and effect sort of uh, causative thinking. So logical thinking has to do with time, events occurring in time, and scientific thinking is the explanation of cause and effect. Now sometimes you have an effect, it may be due to this cause or due to that cause. You may not be sure whether this is really as a cause for this effect. So what you do is that you do control experiment for which you uh, have this cause, it causes this effect, and when you have this cause and not, not this cause, then you don't have this effect. Then you know that this is the real cause for that particular effect. Okay, so in science, we always do uh, cause and effect analysis when we take experimental data to really validate whether things are causative. And I hope you understand uh, a new kind of innovative thinking, which is basically being curious about what caused a particular effect. And we do logical thinking as well as experimental validation of this cause and effect phenomena. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, the mystery of time is really difficult to explain, and I hope I can make you understand why time is really different from space and why we really need to think about space-time. Next time, I'll explain more of this phenomenon uh, when I talk about what's uh, the what aspect of things. Uh, in, I'll talk about what's the matter with energy.